Thank you for coming back. Uh, we're now in the late afternoon session. Um, we are now going to do the measles update. Good afternoon, everybody. We wanted to provide an update on the um, current measles outbreaks in the United States. For context, um, the implementation of a single dose of measles containing vaccine really dramatically reduced the burden of morbidity and mortality associated with measles in the United States. But a resurgence of disease in the late 1980s resulted in both a second dose recommendation prior to school entry um, and contributed to the formulation of the Vaccines for Children program to reduce disparities due to socioeconomic status in vaccination. Coverage with measles containing vaccine overall has been sustained at high levels in the United States. One plus dose coverage among toddlers is 90 to 91% nationwide, but ranges from about 82.5% to over 98%. Drivers of under immunization nationally are related to access, but within states, pockets of uh, under immunization exist and communities that are un under immunized by choice uh, may exist. And those uh, communities are not reflected in these kind of state level maps. To date, in 2019, we've had 1,077 cases of measles reported from 28 states. It's the highest number of cases since measles was declared eliminated in the year 2000, and in fact, the highest number since 1992, or the tail end of the resurgence of measles. We have five current outbreaks of measles, uh, New York State associated with Rockland County, New York City, California, Pennsylvania, and Washington. These last three outbreaks, uh, it's been more than 21 days since the last case onset, so more than one incubation period. So we're hopeful that these outbreaks will be over soon. But the two New York State and New York City outbreaks are ongoing. And in fact, those outbreaks started at the end of September of last year and have been sustained um, through this year. Because measles has been eliminated, all cases and all outbreaks are associated with uh, importations due to travel overseas. High two-dose coverage has really been critical in eliminating, elim in eliminating or limiting transmission when cases are imported. However, when cases are imported into communities with low coverage, measles can spread or, or even in just in exposing individuals who are unvaccinated. This year, we've had 13 outbreaks. 94% uh, of the total case count have been associated with outbreaks. Six of 13 outbreaks have been in close-knit, under-immunized communities, like we're seeing in Rockland County and New York City. And in fact, those two outbreaks have has contributed three quarters of the case counts nationwide. Since the end of last year, there have been over 640 cases in New York City and over 340 in Rockland County. 64 cases have been direct importations. Most of those are uh, US residents who traveled abroad and are returning, but there's a substantial burden in foreign visitors to the United States. The three most common countries from which importations have occurred are the Philippines, Ukraine, and Israel. <clears throat> The global, con <clears throat> excuse me, the global context for these importations is really a threefold increase in measles globally. So measles in is endemic in much of the world, and there are large outbreaks in many parts of the world. So the countries that have imported cases reflect to some degree the burden of disease globally, but especially travel patterns and um, the likelihood of exposing under immunized communities. Since early April, CDC has operated in an incident management structure, operated out of the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases. We have over 100 staff working on the response. We update case counts and outbreak information on our website weekly. 
we're working especially to promote um, vaccination of travelers and reduction of importations and from transmission associated with importations, especially through air contact investigations. We provide technical assistance to states reporting measles cases, including prevention and control measures and vaccine implementation. We work to support case confirmation and genotyping, especially through our vaccine preventable disease collaborations with the state public health labs. We are able to provide on ground assistance when requested. We've had over 25 staff in Rockland County, New York and assisting the state and county um, with their outbreak. We've been especially working to provide evidence-based information and targeted communication resources to promote awareness of measles and of the benefits of vaccination and to establish collaborations with key stakeholders and affected communities. That's the usual partners, including healthcare providers and federally qualified health centers, but in these cases, especially with rabbis and rabbinical organizations and with summer camps, which these counties in New York are um, frequent destinations for summer camps. And then at the end of April, we published uh, the experience of measles with the 704 cases to date that describes the clinical presentation, complications, et cetera. So the United States remains in measles elimination status, although there are prolonged outbreaks in close knit communities that we're working to bring under control. Vaccination coverage remains high, but communities with low coverage continue to be at risk for outbreaks. And in the context of an increase in global measles activity, we expect a continuing risk of importations that we'll work to prevent. Thank you. If there are questions. Any questions? Dr. Schaffer. Tom, nice presentation. Thank you. Of a sad circumstance, I hesitate to ask this question, but what would put our status as having eliminated measles at risk? Measles elimination was declared after more than a year of sustained, of no endemic transmission. And so a year of sustained endemic transmission would put our status at risk. So we're really working to support getting ahead of these outbreaks before that happens. Dr. Kimmel. Uh, on the map that you showed, uh, the U.S. was the same dark color as many other countries in the world. When children under a year of age travel internationally, they're recommended to receive MMR if they're six, between six through 11 months of age. What's the status of a recommendation for such travel within the United States? So in general, I think we can, folks can be reassured that the risk of measles in most of the United States is low. Um, and we're recommending that travelers who intend to, to go to communities where there's sustained transmission and, and likely to be exposed to populations in which measles is being transmitted to follow the recommendations made by the local health departments. But really it's a narrow circumstance. Most people are not at high risk for measles in the U.S. or from travel across the U.S. Yeah. Dr. Lee. At some point, it would be great to hear about um, how you've tailored those implementation strategies, uh, depending on sort of the contextual factors and what you found to be most effective, if that would be appropriate to bring back to ASIP. But I, I would be really interested in that. Thanks. We appreciate that question. Dr. Stevens. Tommy, you may have said, what is the, in those communities where there have been sustained outbreaks, what has been the level of, of uh, vaccine coverage? In some cases, it's been a challenge to really understand coverage in the communities because these are kind of very local phenomenon and the, um, the immunization registries are not always optimal. And then even in New York, in Rockland County, it's been a challenge to understand the denominators. So um, we don't absolutely know coverage prior in the communities. Um, but but there have been a lot of doses delivered in both New York City and in Rockland County, and so we think we are improving coverage, or they are improving coverage. Dr. Hahn. 
Yeah, I just have a comment on the, the elimination, just like the question uh, that was just asked. It's uh, such a challenging thing to message uh, the need for an immunization or the fact that outbreaks are going on, but it's eliminated. It's just a, a real challenge. <laughs> I'm sure you guys are well aware, uh, but I just want to, you know, ask whether there's a way to think of other language that we could use, you know, whether it's um, it's been... Um, interruption has been, you know, transmission has been interrupted, but not use the word elimination. It's just so hard to say it's eliminated, but it's here. It's eliminated, but we have more cases. Just a really, really tough one for us at the state health departments, and I'm sure locals as well. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Hunter. The oh, comment, sorry. and it, I've, we've sort of bridged to um, that means all cases of measles in the United States are associated with travel, and so when they come into communities that are under vaccinated, those communities are at risk. So, but I agree. Dr. Hunter. Are there any um, administrative or logistical implications of losing elimination status, such as insurance coverage or ability to use 317 vaccines in certain situations? No, uh, there shouldn't be. And, and, and there wouldn't also be, uh, you know, of course, there would be a push to reestablish elimination status, but it, it shouldn't have practical implementations on the vaccination program. Dr. Arthur, did you have a question? Dr. Bernstein. What, a, uh, what relationship with the countries that have thousands, if not tens of thousands of cases of measles, what relationship or how, how is the CDC working with those countries, if at all? So I, I would say the um, Global Immunization Division and a different center and CDC works closely on, works on measles globally with and closely with many countries. Um, we're in constant communication with PAHO and WHO around our status and around situational awareness with these countries. And in certain circumstances, we're trying to um, promote um, specific sort of travel associated prevention measures um, with travel from some specific countries. <coughs> Any other questions or comments? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now we'll move on to the next uh, topic, which is um, the Zoster vaccines, uh, and with an introduction by Dr. Moore again. Thank you, and um, I look forward to our next conversation. Uh, this is an update um, on the herpes zoster vaccine surveillance uh, of sa safety monitoring that's going on now. This is a list of everyone who's on the 2019 herpes zoster work group. Uh, we are ably led by our CDC liaison, um, Kathleen Dooling, and assisted by Angela Gua. To remind folks, um, in October of 2017, the ACIP voted to recommend recombinant zoster vaccine to adults age 50 and over. In June of 2018, we presented to the ACIP our plans to monitor safety effectiveness and to update folks on the status of RZV. And in February of 2019, we provided preliminary results of uptake and safety, including a statistical signal for Guillain-Barre syndrome. Today's presentation is a follow-up on additional information for RZV safety monitoring. And I won't take any more of our time. I want to just acknowledge uh, our work group as well as all the other CDC contributors, including those from the Immunization Safety Office, who've been so helpful to us. And I will now hand things over to uh, Tom Shimabakoro for a presentation on safety update. Good afternoon. I uh, have quite a bit of material to cover in a relatively short period of time. So I'm gonna move through this pretty quickly and cover some highlights. So there's a lot of reference material in some of the slides. So I'll be given a, a update on, uh, on uh, a safety monitoring in the vaccine adverse event reporting system, then rapid cycle analysis results from the vaccine safety data link, 
then the FDA assessment of Guillain-Barre syndrome following recombinant zoster vaccine from Medicare data, and then summary and next steps. So this is a table for your reference. It's some key vaccine safety monitoring and research terms. So just to remind you, uh, recombinant zoster vaccine, or RZV, is an adjuvanted glycoprotein vaccine. It was licensed October 2017, and is prefer preferentially recommended by ACIP for adults 50 and older. Initial post-licensure safety data was presented in February, and overall the safety profile of RZV was consistent with pre-licensure clinical trial data. A statistical signal was detected for Guillain-Barre syndrome and VSD, rapid cycle analysis monitoring based on a small number of GBS cases using automated data. Signal assessment is in progress, including an FDA analysis of Medicare data. So I'll start with VAERS monitoring. Just to remind you, VAERS is our spontaneous reporting system. It's co-managed by CDC and FDA. And as a spontaneous reporting system, its main limitation is generally we cannot assess causality from VAERS data alone. VAERS accepts all reports from all reporters without making judgments on causality irrespective of clinical seriousness. It's a hypothesis generating system to identify potential safety concerns that can be studied in more robust systems. So we, we performed a descriptive analysis of RZV reports from October 2017 through April 2019. We also estimated reporting rates based on 11.89 million doses distributed uh, through March 2019. Our FDA colleagues conduct empirical Bayesian data mining to detect disproportional reporting. And we clinically reviewed um, uh, reports for 20 pre-specified outcomes, which are shown here on this slide. So during the analytic period, we had 18,418 reports. Two-thirds were in females. 97% were non-serious, and in 94% of reports, RZV was given alone without other vaccines. The reporting rates for all reports were 154.3 per 100,000 doses distributed, and for serious reports, 3.9 per 100,000 doses distributed. Those are similar to, to what we reported back in February and similar for other vaccines given in this age group. Systemic signs and symptoms and injection site reactions were the most commonly reported adverse events, and there were no unexpected patterns detected by physician reviewers of reports of pre-specified outcomes. We had one empirical Bayesian data mining finding to date, and that's product administered to patients of inappropriate age when looking at individuals aged 19 to 44.9 years old. So in summary, RZV post-licensure safety monitoring findings in VAERS are generally consistent with the safety profile observed in pre-licensure clinical trials. And there were no empirical Bayesian data mining findings except for product administered to a patient of inappropriate age. So now I'll move on to rapid cycle analysis in the vaccine safety data link. Uh, this is a map showing our eight participating integrated health care organizations in the VSD. The VSD has medical care and demographic data on over 12.1 million persons per year. This is the type of data that's in the VSD. It includes data on immunizations, data from encounters with the healthcare system, hospital discharge codes, procedure codes, and demographic information, all linked by unique study IDs. We also have access to the electronic medical record and to paper charts. Just a bit of background on art rapid cycle analysis, I'll call it RCA. It's a powerful and sophisticated tool for near real-time vaccine safety monitoring using sequential monitoring techniques. It employs an automated analysis that uses ICD-coded diagnoses from administrative data. It's a surveillance activity, which is not the same as an epidemiologic study. 
Uh, it is designed to detect statistical signals, which are values above specified statistical thresholds. When a statistical signal occurs, CDC conducts a series of evaluations using traditional epidemiologic methods, chart confirmation to, of diagnoses to confirm or exclude cases as true incident cases is a key part of statistical signal assessment. And importantly, not all statistical signals represent a true increase in risk for an adverse event. So for RZV RCA, we use a historical comparator design. We're looking at current RZV recipients compared to ZVL recipients from 2013 to 2017. And we're monitoring events in the risk window in RZV recipients compared to events in the risk window in the historical ZVL recipients. We're doing monthly near real time sequential monitoring. Um, we are at this, I'll be presenting data from the seventh of 18 planned analyses. The test is statistic is an adjusted likelihood ratio test. These are the 10 high priority pre specified RCA outcomes. Um, the risk interval is 1 to 42 days for all these outcomes, with the exception of anaphylaxis, that's 0 to 1 days. Um, we're, also, uh, we're also monitoring other outcomes, doing descriptive analysis only for uh, uh, another set of outcomes, which you can see here in the uh, footnote, if you can see that. We're also doing a secondary analysis um, using two concurrent comparators. So comparing RZV recipients to those that had an ICD coded well visit during the RZV uptake, uptake period and to those that received another vaccine, not influenza. At the seventh analysis, we have just over 211,000 doses administered in the VSD through December 2018 with follow-up for outcomes through April 2019. This is a summary table of uh, RCA results for the high priority outcomes. As you can see here, there were no statistical signals detected for any of the high priority outcomes with the exception of Bell's palsy and Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, Guillain-Barre syndrome signaled previously and we presented that at February and I'm gonna start with uh, Bell's palsy before I move into uh, updates on GBS. So, Bell's palsy signaled at the fifth analysis. We had a, at that time we had a relative risk of 1.51 with 36 observed events versus 24 expected events. By the seventh analysis, the analysis I'm presenting now, it had attenuated somewhat. We have a rel we now have a relative risk of 1.31, and importantly, the relative risks are not consistently elevated for the concurrent comparator groups. The relative risks are actually less than one in the well visit comparator group and less than one in the other non-influenza vaccine recipient comparator group. Um, chart review and adjudication of the 36 cases um, at the signaling, signaling analysis um, have indicated that 21 cases ruled out and 15 cases were um, classified as definite cases with onset in the one to 42 day risk window. That's a chart confirmation rate of about 40%. Uh, we also um, reviewed these Bell's palsy. We also reviewed Bell's palsy reports that came into VARES. Um, there were no empirical Bayesian data mining findings and nor, no proportional reporting ratio findings for Bell's palsy. And after review and adjudication of the Bell's palsy reports, we estimate a reporting rate of 1.2 cases per million RZV doses distributed. So moving on to Guillain Barre syndrome. This is the same table you saw, but I'm just focusing on GBS. So GBS signaled at the second analysis. At that time, we had three observed events versus 0.6 expected for a relative risk of 5.25. Currently, at the seventh analysis, we have five observed events, 1.6 expected events for a relative risk of 3.18. Um, keep that five in mind, that number five observed events after RZV because this is the chart adjudication for those five events. Um, three of these ruled out. Two of these ICD-10 coded GBS cases were prior diagnoses of GBS, so they were not true incident cases. 
and one case had GBS symptom onset prior to vaccination. So we have two confirmed cases, one Brighton level two GBS case and one Brighton level three. With the Brighton level three, there was uh, information in the chart of a probable respiratory infection prior to GBS symptom onset. As part of the statistical signal assessment for GBS, we also reviewed all the uh, GBS cases and the historical ZVL comparator. Um, upon chart review of these five cases and the historical comparator, two cases ruled out. One was a prior diagnosis, so not an incident case. Another case upon chart review was given an alternate, alternative diagnosis of chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. And one case, we were unable to confirm the case because the medical records were not available. And we had two confirmed cases, Brighton Level 2 with onset in the risk window. So two confirmed cases following RZV and two confirmed uh, at the seventh analysis and two confirmed cases following ZVL in the historical ZVL cohort. So um, this is a busy slide, but what you're looking at at the top line there our chart confirmed is the chart confirmed GBS incidence rate in the v VSD RZV cohort. That's the point estimate uh, of 8.2 with a confidence interval ranging from 1 um, to uh, 29.7. And then the second line is the chart confirmed GBS incident rate in the historical uh, VSD ZVL cohort. It's a point estimate of 2.4 with an incidence rate from 0.7 to 10.4. The third line down there is a range of GBS incidence rates from a systematic uh, review and a meta-analysis. So that's not a confidence interval, that's a range of estimates of GBS. Um, and those range from 0.32 to, to 4.7. So that, that, that's um, all these are in uh, per 100,000 person years. And then the final line there is, the, is a GBS incidence rate estimate from data from a VSD analysis, point estimate of 3.64 per 100,000 person years with a confidence interval from 2.5 to 5.1. The, uh, the relative risk there is just looking at the RZV cohort compared to the ZVL cohort. You look up on the right side there of the slide, that's a relative risk of 2.3 with a wide confidence interval I'm sorry, a relative risk of 3.5 with a wide confidence interval going from 0.3 to 47.8, a risk difference of 5.9 per 100,000 person years, ranging from point confidence interval from point, negative 0.6 to 17.7. So one is in the confidence interval for the relative risk and zero is in the confidence interval for the risk difference. So to date, the estimated VSD chart confirmed GBS rate in the current RZV cohort is higher than in the historical ZVL cohort and higher than published estimates from the literature. You can see that from that point estimate of 8.2. However, uncertainty around the VSD estimated GBS rate following RZV is large. The confidence interval ranges from 1 to 29.7 and overlapping with the background rates reported in the literature. So, um, we decided to do a sensitivity analysis and see what, what would happen if we assigned that unconfirmed case um, as a true incident case. And this is in the ZVL, historical ZVL comparator. So when we do that, what you're seeing here, the, the, the only um, data that has changed here is the GBS instance rate in the historical ZVL cohort. Um, and that's now based on three cases because we assign that case as a true incident case. So now the incidence rate there is 3.6 um, with a confidence interval ranging from 0.7 to 10.4. And when we do that, that may not look like, um, based on the scale of this graph, that's not a big difference. But um, following that, the relative risk decreases from 3.5 to 2.3 and the risk, the risk difference decreases from 5.9 to 4.7. And I think that illustrates, um, that's not a trivial change and that illustrates um, the, the challenges when you're working with um, small numbers, so rare outcomes and small numbers of doses administered. So um, our, our review of uh, GBS cases to VAERS 
Um, there were no empirical Bayesian data mining findings, no proportional reporting ratio findings. And after review and adjudication of VAERS reports, we estimate a reporting rate of 2.4 cases per million RZV doses distributed. So now I want to discuss an FDA assessment of the risk of GBS following recombinant zoster vaccine and Medicare data. And these slides are courtesy of Rich Forshi at CBER. So upon detection of the statistical signal, we consulted with FDA on the possibility of an additional analysis in other databases. Um, subsequently, FDA, in collaboration with CDC and CMS, initiated an assessment of the risk of GBS following RZV and Medicare data. The interim results of an automated analysis are available, and I'll be presenting those. Additional work to refine the analysis is in progress. So FDA focused on replicating uh, the signaling VSD analysis. It's a cohort comparison of post-vaccination GBS rate between a vaccinated RZV population and historical vaccinated ZVL population. Um, vaccinations are identified using NDC codes in Part D. The RZV vaccination window is October 2017 to December 2018. The ZVL vaccination window is October 2012 through September 2017. The population includes individuals who aged into Medicare during those periods, so they were already 65 years old. And they had to have continuous enrollment in Medicare Parts A, B, and D for 365 days prior to vaccination. Um, that's to ensure that there was no GBS in the 365, 365 days prior to the vaccination date. Um, they used a 1 to 40 day post-vaccination uh, risk window. And the outcome was ICD-coded um, inpatient GBS. This is a plot of the temporal distribution of the GBS cases during the risk window. You see the, the um, RZV cases there in the blue dots and the ZVL cases there in the green dots. And this table shows the GBS outcome rates and model results. So on the first row there, we, we have um, results from the RZV vaccinated cohort. There were 15 ICD coded GBS cases. 1.3 million eligible doses. You see the total person time there. That comes out to an outcome rate of 0 0.29 per 100,000 person days. Moving down to the next row, uh, we have the ZVL vaccinated cohort. There were nine ICD coded GBS cases, 1.8 million eligible doses. That's an outcome rate of zero or 0 0.012 per 100,000 person days. The rate ratio is simply the outcome rate of RZV vaccinated divided by the outcome rate of ZVL vaccinated. And after adjusting for age and sex, we have a rate ratio of 2.34 with a 95% confidence interval just over 1, 1.01 up to 5.41. This is showing the similar data in just a little different format. Um, here we're looking at outcome per million doses. So for the RZV cohort, um, the outcome rate is 11.38 per million doses administered. For the ZVL cohort, it's 4.95 per million doses administered. The attributable, the, the rate ratio is the same. That's just taken from the slide. But now we put this into an attributable risk per million doses. And that comes out, adjusted for age and sex, and that comes out to 6.54 additional GBS cases per million doses administered with a 95% confidence interval going from negative 0.11 to 13.9. So in summary, um, the FDA cohort analysis showed an elevated adjusted rate ratio of 2.34 with a 95% confidence interval um, from 1.01 to 5.41. These results should be interpreted with, with caution. This is an automated analysis using ICD-coded GBS diagnoses. Chart review and confirmation of cases is pending. It's a current, current versus historical comparisons are subject to potential confounding and require adjustments which are in progress. A chart-confirmed self-controlled analysis is planned which will control for many potential confounders of historical, um, versus, of, uh, historical comparator designs. So I'm going to briefly cover some secondary outcomes and secondary analyses. 
Um, this, th this first bullet and sub bullets are descriptive analysis of the lower priority outcomes in the historical comparator design. As you see there, for these uh, lower priority outcomes, the relative risks are either less than one, approximately one, or, or just exceeding one for, for these lower priority outcomes. Um, when, when looking at the, higher pro the high priority outcomes, looking at the well comparator visits during the RZV uptake period, all high priority outcomes had a relative risk of less than one except GBS, which was slightly elevated. And looking at other non-influenza vaccine recipient comparators and the high priority outcomes, the relative risk was less than one for all outcomes except GBS. So summary and next steps, um, kind of where are we and where are we going? Um, we're still in the initial uptake period for RZV and early and post-licensure monitoring, considering constraints on supply. There have been 11.89 million RZV doses distributed for the U.S. market, 211,000 doses in the seventh VSD rapid cycle analysis, and 1.3 million doses included in the FDA Medicare analysis. Just for perspective, um, this past flu season, we had 5.4 million doses administered in the VSD. There have been no concerning patterns or findings of disproportional reporting for adverse events in VAERS. There have been statistical signals detected for Bell's palsy and GBS in VSD rapid cycle analysis and automated analyses, and an ele elevated rate ratio for GBS detected in the FDA cohort analysis in, in Medicare data using automated analysis. For the assessment of the statistical signal for Bell's palsy, um, the, uh, the statistical signals are not consistent across comparators. Currently, the relative risk in the main analysis, the primary analysis, is 1.31, but the relative risks are less than 1 in the secondary concurrent comparator analysis. So for the assessment of the statistical signal for GBS, we have chart reviewed all the potential GBS cases identified by ICD-10 codes in both the RZV exposed and the historical ZVL recipients. The chart confirmed relative risk is 3.5. The 95% confidence interval is very wide, going from 0.3 to 47.8, and that's based on two RZV cases and two ZVL confirmed cases. The risk difference is 5.9 per 100,000 person years with a confidence interval negative six up to 17.7. Um, the interim results of the FDA cohort analysis do show an elevated rate ratio, 2.34, with the lower bound just above one, 1.01, and an attributable risk of 6.54 additional cases per million doses administered. Um, the 95% confidence interval going from negative 0.1 to 13.9, so including zero. Additional analysis and chart review and confirmation is pending for the FDA study. So final thoughts and next steps. The safety profile of RZV is generally consistent with pre-licensure clinical trial data. Two systems have detected an increased risk for GBS. However, numbers are small in VSD and chart reviews are pending in the FDA Medicare analysis. CDC will continue to monitor GBS and Bell's palsy in VSD. FDA is in the process of accessing uh, charts to review GBS cases in the Medicare cohort analysis and will consider doing a chart confirmed self-control analysis to further assess the risk of GBS following RZV. And so I just want to close by emphasizing um, what we believe is our take-home message at this point in the post-licensure monitoring process, and, and is that the initial data is with respect to GBS. The initial safety monitoring data so far are insufficient to conclude that a safety problem exists for GBS, but further evaluation and continued vigilance are warranted. I want to thank the following individuals for their contributions. I also want to thank the work group for all the feedback they provided during the preparation of this presentation. Thanks. Any questions or comments? So, um, any, yes, Dr. Lee? 
Thank you so much for the uh, excellent presentation, Dr. Shima Bukuro. Um, just a couple of questions or clarifications for next steps. I just wanted to make sure. Uh, number one, on the uh, VSD analysis, it looks like there's a concurrent uh, analysis also happening. Um, will those be forthcoming? I realize the numbers are probably incredibly small for that concurrent analysis. Um, but I uh, wanted to just check in about that. And then the other two um, items were just specifically calling out seasonality for GBS as one of the potential confounders. So seasonality of disease. And I don't know if there's any seasonality of RZV vaccination, um, just given the kind of um, sudden uptake <laughs> and then supply issues. So i um, wondering if it would be worth looking at that. Um, I mean, we'll, be, we'll, we'll present the results of the primary and the secondary analyses um, as requested by the work group and as requested by CDC and include them um, at our updates. As far as, did you say seasonality of RZV vaccination? Uh, so primarily I was mostly worried about seasonality of GBS, but um, I just was curious if there was any odd shapes in the curve for uh, uh, RZV. I'm realizing now so that for, you showed so the for, uptake curve and uptake. it looked like it was fairly... Um, stable throughout, so probably there wasn't any in the VSD, but I just didn't know if there's any difference in Medicare. So I'm I'm not aware of of any seasonality for uptake um, either in VSD or in the Medicare, but um, I I think uptake has been it's probably not uh, uptake has been constrained by supply, so it's probably not the normal uptake you would have if it basically supply was meeting demand. Dr. Hunter. Yeah, just to follow up on the seasonality, um, the thought occurred to me that did you, since influenza can increase GBS uh, rates, um, did you look to see that um, either the cases or just the rates between cases and non-cases through a chart review um, had more or less influenza diagnosed in them? Uh, none of the confirmed cases had influenza vaccination. None of the confirmed RZV. Are you talking about not vaccination disease? Disease. Um, we haven't done. We haven't. We haven't looked for um, influenza disease uh, as, as part of this analysis. Dr. Moore. Uh, Dr. Romero, it may be helpful to have the work group uh, interpretation of the results. Uh, presented before we have a more in-depth conversation about the safety because that we have a brief presentation available on that if it if, if you are in agreement with that I'm, I'm sorry I missed that I was talking with it, it may be helpful for our purposes of our discussion to have Dr. Dooling present the work group's interpretation of the safety stuff before we have an in-depth discussion uh, just a moment because I believe GSK Dr. Friedland wanted to offer a comment is that correct input um, uh, thank you. It would be my pleasure. Leonard Friedland from GSK. I uh, just want to mention, as we did last time, that GSK's top priority, of course, is patient safety, and we are committed to monitoring and ensuring the safety of all of our vaccines, which, of course, includes Shingrix. As was indicated in the presentation uh, today at ACIP, and thank you, Tom, for that presentation, the ongoing safety monitoring data to date are insufficient to conclude that a safety problem exists for GBS or Bell's palsy, but continued vigilance and further evaluation are warranted. So what are we doing at GSK? We're gonna to continue to monitor reports of GBS and Bell's palsy following vaccination with Shingrix through our enhanced pharmacovigilance, and we will be evaluating any new information that becomes available. In addition, incident cases of GBS will be measured in the objectives of our planned post-marketing targeted safety studies. Uh, and in summary, we remain confident in the favorable benefit risk ratio profile of Shingrix for the prevention of herpes zoster. And GSK will continue to work closely with the CDC and the FDA to actively monitor the safety of Shingrix. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, if Dr. Dooling would like to present. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the work group would like to thank the Immunization Safety Office, as well as the Vaccine Safety Data Link and FDA for their contributions towards monitoring the safety of recombinant zoster vaccine. 
The following slides are a summary of the herpes zoster workgroup interpretation of the zoster, uh, recombinant zoster vaccine safety data. There have been approximately 12 million doses of recombinant zoster vaccine distributed in the U.S. since the vaccine was licensed. Thus far, the most common reports have involved non-serious reactogenicity-like symptoms, consistent with findings from the randomized control trial. The rapid cycle analysis has yielded preliminary statistical signals for two conditions, Bell's palsy and Guillain-Barre syndrome, or GBS. I'd now like to present a summary of the data the work group felt was really key in interpreting uh, these signals and organized in a framework of increasing certainty of classification and association. So that's starting with the events reported in VAERS followed by data from ICD-9 and ICD-10 automated uh, sources. And finally, those cases which have been validated by vaccine safety experts and are known to be cases that occurred in the 42 days following vaccination. So starting with investigation of Bell's palsy following recombinant zoster vaccine, there were no signals in VAERS. With respect to administrative data cases, uh, there was an increased risk when compared to historical zoster, uh, zoster vaccine live in VSD. However, uh, there was no increased risk when concurrent comparator groups were used. Upon medical chart review of those administrative cases of Bell's palsy, only 15 or 36 or 42% were actually validated as true incident cases. Switching now to the investigation of GBS following recombinant zoster vaccine, there were no signals in VAERS. With respect to administrative cases, an increased relative risk was observed in both VSD and Medicare uh, based on historical rates following zoster vaccine live. However, the relative risk was lower when compa concurrent comparator groups were used in VSD. And upon medical chart review of the administrative cases of uh, GBS, two cases were validated as true incident cases in the recombinant zoster vaccine group and two in the zoster vaccine live group. This resulted in a risk difference of between 4.7 and 5.9 cases per 100,000 person years. That represents an increased risk relative to zoster vaccine live, uh, as well as baseline rates from the literature. However, due to small numbers, the confidence intervals are very large. In summary, GBS is rare and interpretation of an elevated risk of GBS is uncertain given only two validated cases in the recombinant zoster vaccine and the zoster vaccine live groups. Due to wide confidence intervals that overlap baseline rates, current data are insufficient to determine if a safety problem exists. The herpes zoster workgroup members agreed that there is insufficient evidence at this time to support a change in policy or practice with regard to recombinant zoster vaccine. The herpes zoster workgroup agrees with the proposed next steps. Reiterated, those are to continue enhanced monitoring and clinical case review of Bell's palsy and GBS reports following recombinant zoster vaccine in VAERS, to continue to track and chart validate cases of Bell's palsy and GBS within the VSD network, and finally to chart validate GBS cases in Medicare and pursue self-controlled analytic options. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any comments, questions from the voting members? Dr. Bernstein. Uh, then this may be more for Tom. I was just wondering whether uh, there's anything with um, the use of a novel adjuvant and GBS or Bell's palsy. Uh, none of these, none, none of the cases in VSD um, had co-administration of a vaccine with a, a another co-administration of vaccine that had a novel adjuvant. Um, I would I would have to um, get back to you on the VAERS reports, but in the VAERS reports, 90 plus percent of the Bell's palsy and the GBS cases, um, in, in 90, over 90 percent of those RZV is administered alone. Um, and as you saw from just the reports in general, um, it's, it tends to be administered alone. Uh, th there have been several um, reports of, of um, adverse events following uh, RZV co-administered with uh, 
I believe it was fluad, I think, and um, they were injection site reactions and non-serious. How about the just the, the adjuvant itself? Uh, it, were there studies, and when the adjuvant was being studied, were there uh, cases of either Bell's palsy or GBS noted? In the in the you mean the the pre the use of that the yeah. develop. Yes. And then the clinical development or clinical yes. trials, I'd have to defer to the manufacturer on that. I, I, don't, I don't know the answer. Does the manufacturer wish to comment? Uh, Leonard Friedland from JSK. In the clinical trials uh, leading to licensure of Shingrix, there was no increased risk of GBS or Bell's palsy noted in our clinical trials. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Dr. Moore. I just want to comment that you know, I think the work group feels that it's very important to be transparent in displaying the process of how vaccine safety evaluation works. Doing vaccine safety evaluation in an older adult population where there are a lot of underlying issues in play is more complicated than in young healthy children uh, with very few background is health issues. Um, and we also acknowledge that although numbers are presented here that may appear quite precise, important, uh, it's very difficult to study Guillain-Barre syndrome, as some have alluded to, the seasonality that can be involved, different uh, rates based on age and other things. So it is possible that as additional refinements to the studies are done, uh, we may have an accurate, more accurate picture that it has different numbers than the numbers that are presented today. So I just caution people to um, look at the trends but not get fixated on any particular numbers because in, um, important adjustments uh, to address confounding that hasn't yet been addressed m might result in a different look to the final results as we get more information and a better analysis but we wanted to share the process to let people know where we are because it could take a little while before those analyses are done. Dr. May Lee. I respond to the seasonality question uh, that was posed before and brought up by Kelly? Uh, keep in mind that the analyses you saw today were based on doses really given in 2018. And the vaccine didn't become uh, largely available until March and April of 2018. So these are really uh, only cover part of a calendar year up until December 23rd, the doses that are contained in the analyses presented here. Dr. Lee. Uh, thank you. Thanks for that information. I just wanted to echo what Dr. Moore uh, said, which is um, really thankful to ISO for the um, both the incredible vaccine safety system that's been developed uh, and that enhances our ability to really monitor in near real time any adverse events that occur. I think that's a huge testament to the fact that we're doing this sort of dynamic look over time. Uh, also, really appreciate um, the you know transparency and the you know uh, yeah, the willingness to uh, think critically with us about a feedback and how we can make those analyses better. So overall, it's just uh, I really wanted to say thank you because the analyses have been excellent actually to date and uh, have really appreciated the engagement on this. Any other comments or questions? Okay, none being, we'll move on. We'll do uh, next pertussis vaccines with an introduction by Dr. Bernstein. Thank you, we are in the home stretch. So this next session is on uh, pertussis vaccines. There are no votes related uh, to this. I wanted to first to be sure to recognize uh, the ACIP pertussis vaccines work group. Dr. Hunter is an ACIP member on the work group. They're ex officio members, liaison representatives, invited expert consultants, and of course our illustrious lead, Dr. Fiona Havers. I also want to be sure to uh, acknowledge our other CDC colleagues and their instrumental in rounding out all that we do on the uh, pertussis work group. 
So today what we want to do is we want to address three particular questions. Uh, the first question is, should the current recommendation that non-pregnant adults receive a single lifetime dose of Tdap with TD boosters every 10 years be changed to allow any TD containing vaccine, that's Tdap or TD, to be used for the decennial TD booster? The second question is, should any TD-containing vaccine, again, Tdap or Td, be allowed for tetanus prophylaxis in the setting of wound management? Those were our initial terms of reference, and another question cropped up as we were uh, doing our work, and that is, should the catch-up immunization schedule for Tdap and Td be changed for those who are seven years of age or older. So what prompted these uh, questions? Well, the most important thing that prompted it was the FDA label change to Sanofi's Tdap product, Adacel. The routine booster allows a second dose of Adacel be administered greater than or equal to eight years after the first dose of Tdap. It's also that the Adacel can be used in wound management and a booster dose of Adacel may be administered if it's been at least five years since the previous receipt of a tetanus toxoid containing vaccine. Note that there's no change to GSK's Tdap uh, product, Boostrix, at the moment. There's also clear evidence that repeat Tdap vaccination is widespread. This is the current ACIP Tdap recommendations for non-pregnant adolescents and adults. Since 2005, ACIP has recommended a single dose of Tdap for adolescents and adults aged 11 years and older. There is no minimum interval since the last TD vaccine before Tdap can be given. At this time, only pregnant women are recommended to receive more than one dose of Tdap with the dose being given during every pregnancy. Please note that that's an off-label recommendation that has been in place since 2012. Per the current guidance, to maintain protection against tetanus and diphtheria in those who have received a single dose of Tdap, a decennial TD booster vaccine is recommended every 10 years and may be indicated for wound management if it has been more than five years since the last tetanus toxoid containing vaccine. Per our terms of, work, of reference on our work group, we will be discussing whether this language should be changed to allow any TD containing vaccine, either Tdap or Td, to be used for decennial Td booster or for wound management. Now, lastly, we uh, wanted to comment on the third question that I uh, mentioned to you, and that is that the Tdap primary immunization schedule for those seven years of age and older who have not been fully immunized. And as you can see, one dose of Tdap is important as part of the catch-up series, and preferably that should be given as the first dose. If additional doses are needed, TD is supposed to be given. And recognize that the catch-up schedule does include pregnant women. So now I'm going to turn the uh, microphone over to Fiona, and she is going to talk about evidence uh, to recommendations framework around these issues in order to answer the questions that we're dealing with. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bernstein, for that introduction, and thank you all for hanging in there because it has been a long day. I will begin by going over the evidence to recommendations framework for the two main vaccine policy questions, the focus on the use of Tdap for the decennial TD booster and for tetanus prophylaxis in the setting of wound management. This will begin with the discussion of benefits and harms. As we discussed at the October ACIP meeting, 
the previous pertussis vaccines work group had assessed in detail whether to preferentially recommend that Tdap replace Td. Our present work group reviewed these considerations, but in general, the work group focused on programmatic issues, including the impact that changing the recommendations would have on clinical providers. Because our focus was on programmatic considerations, we did not do a detailed grade analysis of the benefits and harms of potential changes to recommendations. We will then review the evidence of other elements of the ETR framework listed here and the workgroup interpretation, and then move to a discussion of the catch-up immunization schedule. We will begin the ETR framework discussion with benefits and harms. Benefits to providers in include ease and flexibility. It is often challenging to determine whether a patient has previously received Tdap, and it is cumbersome to have to stock both TD and Tdap vaccines. The work group had concluded that there are benefits to giving providers flexibility to administer either Tdap or TD. There was considerable uncertainty about the potential benefits that result from the impact of repeat Tdap vaccination on pertussis prevention and control. There is evidence that a second dose of Tdap is immunogenic, although immunogenicity data after the receipt of more than two doses of Tdap is lacking. In addition, the duration of protection is uncertain and may vary by population group. There is some evidence of short duration of protection in persons who were given acyl acellular pertussis vaccines for their childhood series, but there is a lack of data on duration of protection among those primed with whole cell pertussis vaccines in childhood. In addition, Tdap vaccines have an uncertain role in the prevention of transmission and herd immunity. While several work group members felt that Tdap should be preferentially recommended to replace TD, the majority of work group members felt that there was insufficient evidence of benefits in pertussis control to recommend that Tdap replace TD for all decennial boosters. The work group also looked specifically at healthcare personnel and whether recommendations should be different than for the general population. This had also been reviewed by the previous ACIP pertussis work group. While pertussis transmission has been documented in healthcare settings, there are insufficient data that healthcare personnel are at increased risk for pertussis infection. In addition, there is a lack of strong evidence that additional Tdap doses for healthcare personnel would be beneficial for pertussis control in healthcare settings. So, while several work group members felt that Tdap should be preferentially recommended to replace TD for healthcare personnel, the majority of work group members felt that there was insufficient evidence of benefits in pertussis control to have recommendations for healthcare personnel that are different than those for the general population. Regarding potential harms, safety data on a second Tdap vaccination were reviewed by the previous work group. And as you may recall, more recent data were presented at the October, AC, October 2018 ACIP meeting. While the work group acknowledged that there were a number of studies that examined the safety of a second Tdap vaccination, there were few that looked at more than two doses. Nevertheless, they concluded that based on the evidence available, there were no substantive safety concerns in allowing Tdap to be used for the decennial booster or for tetanus prophylaxis in the setting of wound management. The work group concluded that, in general, the benefits to implementing the recommendation changes outweigh harms. Now, moving on to other elements of the evidence to recommendations framework. We looked at evidence indicating whether patients and providers value or have a preference for repeat Tdap vaccination. There have been no studies specifically asking the preferences of stakeholders, which we defined as the general adult population, as well as providers and immunization programs. However, note that the proposed recommendation doesn't require any additional vaccine doses, likely making it acceptable to patients. And then on the next few slides, I will also present evidence that indicate that repeat Tdap vaccination is already a widespread practice, indicating that providers may prefer using Tdap in place of TD. On this slide, we show the public sector purchases for adult doses of TD, shown in purple, and Tdap, shown in gray, for the seven years from 2011 to 2017. As you can see, in any given year, 
TDAP purchases are at least tenfold more than TD purchases. We also explored other data sources for evidence of this, including a study by the Vaccine Safety Data Link, which included almost 69,000 patients who had received Tdap and then later received another TD-containing vaccine. Among these patients, 89% received Tdap for their second vaccine, while only 11% received TD. This trend is confirmed by information from a large database of insurance claims in which Tdap claims outnumbered TD claims by more than 11 to 1. Given these data, it is likely that giving Tdap in place of TD is already a widespread practice, despite the fact that it is not currently recommended by ACIP, and in many instances, is still in off-label use. The work group concluded that this likely indicates that allowing either Tdap or TD to be used would be acceptable and feasible for stakeholders and may actually be preferred by providers. Now moving on to resource use. Tdap is more expensive than TD. This slide shows two different sources of cost data. The top half of the slide shows data from the CDC vaccine price list with the cost per dose for the generic TD compared with the two Tdap products. The incremental cost of Tdap over TD was approximately $11 in this data source. The bottom part of the slide shows claims data from commercially insured persons. In this slide, the median cost for Tdap was approximately $22 more than for TD. So now we come to the question of resource use and whether allowing either Tdap or TD to be used in place of TD is a reasonable and efficient allocation of resources. The work group did review pricing of the two types of vaccines and also economic impact analyses, including a detailed review of an internal CDC analysis. However, the relevance of the economic data to this issue is questionable if providers are already giving multiple Tdap doses. Indeed, for all economic analyses available, there is considerable uncertainty for a number of key parameters, particularly pertussis incidence estimates, which vary widely. Pertussis is underdiagnosed and likely underreported, and there's lack of reliable estimates of disease burden, particularly in adults. Estimates are also uncertain for initial vaccine effectiveness, duration of protection, and other parameters. In addition, no analyses of the economic impact accounted for cost savings, resulting in providers only carrying one vaccine instead of two, and the impact on pertussis epidemiology, resulting from the fact that multiple doses of Tdap were likely already given, already being given. After evaluating the economic evidence, the work group concluded that the economic impact analyses did not drive their decision-making process for these particular programmatic questions. So, should any TD containing vaccine, Tdap or TD, be used to be allowed to be used for the decennial TD booster and for tetanus prophylaxis in the setting of wound management? The work group concluded that allowing this recommendation gave increased flexibility to providers and that there may be some additional benefit for pertussis control, but that there was not enough evidence to preferentially recommend Tdap over TD. They concluded that there were no substantive safety concerns, and given this, the benefits of the recommendation change outweighs potential harms. The work group also concluded that providers value flexibility and that there is evidence that Tdap has largely replaced TD regardless of current recommendations, which indicates that the change would be valued by stakeholders and that it is likely acceptable and feasible. Although Tdap is more expensive than TD, economic analyses had limited utility. Given that the change has been widely implemented already, regardless of the higher cost and the uncertainty of key parameters in the various economic models, economic impact was not a major consideration for the work group for these questions. So while the work group was discussing these questions for the decennial TD booster and wound management, one further question arose. Should any TD containing vaccine, Tdap or TD, be allowed for additional to catch up doses for those persons seven years and older with an incomplete or unknown vaccination history? As Dr. Bernstein mentioned in his introduction, the current catch up schedule consists of three doses, one Tdap, preferably the first and two subsequent TD doses. 
One policy option discussed was to make no change to the current catch-up schedule, shown here. The work group discussed whether the catch-up immunization schedule should be a dose of Tdap followed by two doses of either Tdap or Td, which would allow pr providers flexibility in choosing which vaccine to give for the additional doses. We also discussed whether more than one dose of Tdap should be preferentially recommended over Td for either one or both of the additional doses. The majority of the work group agreed with a permissive change in the recommendations, which states that at least one dose of the catch-up schedule should remain Tdap, but that the additional doses could be either TD or Tdap. The rationale to this was similar to that for the two main policy questions already addressed, in that there were benefits to providers in having more flexibility and ease of use. There also may be some additional benefit to having more than one pertussis-containing vaccine for pertussis protection in previously unimmunized persons, but there was not enough evidence to preferentially recommend Tdap over Td. In addition, particularly if the other recommendations are put into place, and result in a decrease in the availability of TD, increased flexibility for providers would be helpful. One final nuance was noted. As you know, the current catch-up schedule is the same for pregnant women as for the general population, and any changes would therefore also apply to pregnant women. Previously unimmunized pregnant women may require two doses of a tetanus toxoid containing vaccine to prevent neonatal and obstetric tetanus. Data are lacking on the safety of multiple doses of Tdap during a single pregnancy. There are some data from pregnancy registries of patients who inadvertently received more than one dose during a, signal, a single pregnancy, and there have been no concerning safety signals for this or for women who received closely spaced Tdap vaccinations in different pregnancies. Thus, the work group concluded that recommendations for catch-up immunization in pregnancy should be similar to those for the general population. Note that if the changes discussed in this presentation are adopted by ACIP, there are several situ situations in which recommendations would be off-label. This slide shows the two licensed Tdap products with a summary of their FDA-approved indications, usage, and administration in the second column. The last three columns indicate where use of these two products would be off-label if recommendations were changed for the decennial TD booster, tetanus prophylaxis in the setting of wound management, and the catch-up immunization series. Note that off-label indications based on age haven't changed. New off-label indications for Adacel would include any routine or catch-up Tdap dose beyond a second dose administers eight or more years from a first Tdap dose, if not given for wound prophylaxis within the specified guidance. For Boostrix, any additional doses of Boostrix beyond the single license dose would be off-label. The work group did not find any reason to distinguish between these two products in making their recommendations. So, in summary, for the three questions of whether either Tdap or Td should be allowed to be used for the decennial booster, for tetanus prophylaxis in the setting of wound management, or for additional doses of the catch-up immunization schedule for persons aged seven years and older, the work group was in favor of these interventions. So I'd like to thank all of the work group members and, and I'm now open for questions. Any questions or need of clarification from the voting members? Dr. Walter. Uh, yeah, I think you included one article in our package, but how much data is there on re repeated short-term administration of Tdap, yeah, say, that's particularly safety data. I know there is for pregnant women every pregnancy or sequential pregnancies, but. Yeah, so that one article that I included was a study. I didn't have time to go into great detail in it here, but I included it in your background um, packet because that was a study done on Boostrix where they looked at a zero, one, and six month, like a, basically a catch-up schedule comparing TD and Tdap, and there were no concerning safety signals in that. But other than that, I don't think that there is a lot of other data out there. So, but thank you for asking that. Any other comments or questions from the liaison members? None being? I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Forgive me, Dr. McNally. I miss McNally. I'm looking at, it's page 18 in our binder. It's the policy option for adolescent and adult series for those with incomplete or unknown vaccine history. 
in the work group recommendation item number two, it is possible, I believe, that TDAP could be given three times? Yes. Okay. And if I look back at slide seven, it does indicate that there um, is data lacking on the safety of two or more TDAP doses. So I just want to know if safety data is going to potentially be forthcoming. Well, the, just to be clear, the safety data is, there is a number of studies, many of which were presented at the October work group on two doses of Tdap. So repeat Tdap vaccination has been studied. There haven't been that many doses on like, uh, that many studies on more than two doses. Um, but there haven't been any concerning safety signals in terms, in those studies. And uh, yeah, so we, ha we have data on two doses of Tdap. Um, and that was been presented to ACIP. I just wanted to point out there was the one study that we mentioned that had three closely spaced doses of Tdap, but there isn't a lot of other studies looking at more than two doses. Do you, are, do you want us to review that at the next ACIP meeting? I would please appreciate that. Thank you. Dr. Lee. Did I see a hand? No, okay. Anyone? Uh, Patsy Stinchild from NAPNAP. Is there any data on Tdap as a primary series? I know when we talked about Tdap initially, it was really uh, effectiveness based on primary series of DTAP. We can review that. Again, the main, I mean, looking at, the, there has been the one study that I mentioned that looked at, it, it was done in Germany, and it looked like at a cohort of adults that had either not received any vaccine for at least 20 years or had an unknown vaccination history. So that was a study that was comparing TD versus Tdap as the primary immunization series. And it was immunogenically equal between T for the tetanus and the diphtheria component. And then there was some antibody boost with the pertussis component. But that's the main data that has looked at that. But there is not a lot of studies looking at that. Dr. Harari. Thank you. Hi, this is Susan Hariri. I'm the team lead for the epidemiology team. Um, and I just wanted to point out that Tdap was licensed for adolescent use. And so the DTAP um, vaccine is the only one that's actually licensed for use for primary series in children. Yeah, Tdap is what is used for a primary series if a person is getting a catch-up schedule for if they were unimmunized and they're seven years and older. But there, there's not that much data on it. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Just one other comment. Yeah. Um, this is Patsy from NAPNAP. Um, so tetanus is state reportable, right? And to CDC, you're tracking and trending tetanus. So because I'm, we're seeing an emergence of refusal uh, for wound care in our emergency room of people refusing um, tetanus, either TD or Tdap. And um, I know there's three children in Italy in the ICU now with tetanus. A report I read yesterday. So I think this is seems like a little uh, trend and worrisome that we should keep our eye on. Thank you for that comment. All right. Any other comments? Okay. So rabies um, will not present uh, at this session. So uh, I move to adjourn. At this time, unless someone has I'm other. Just tired. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I don't hear any objections. So moved. We will adjourn. So adjourn just... until tomorrow. <laughs>